Well, good morning. Uh, thank you all for joining us. I'm Aaron Woodrick, the Director of the Domestic Policy Program at the McDonald laurie Institute. I want to welcome you all to today's discussion on innovation and specifically how innovation works. And to do that, I'm thrilled to have a leading authority on innovation, a man who's written at great length about it, Matt Ridley. Matt is a member of the UK's House of Lords and the author of several books that together have sold well over a million copies in 32 languages, including The Rational Optimist, Viral, The Origins of COVID-19, together with Alina Chan, and perhaps most germane for today's discussion, How Innovation Works and Why It Flourishes in Freedom. Matt, I want to thank you so much for speaking with me today, and it's a great pleasure to chat with you again. Aaron, it's great to be back, back with you at uh, McDonald Laurier, and uh, thanks for having me. So I maybe wanted to start with a very broad question. We know innovation is a very uh, popular word. Politicians love to trot it out. Journalists love it, thought leaders, so to speak. What is it about innovation that makes it so important uh, and what makes it impact um, the lives of everyday people? Well, you're right. A lot of people pay lip service to innovation. They talk about the importance of innovation in their companies and things, and they, you know, nobody's against it at that level. Um, although lots of people in practice sort of are not so in favour of it. But uh, I think it's the main event. It's the reason we are living lives of great prosperity compared with uh, previous generations. Why poverty has become much much scarcer in the world than it used to be. Um, and why we are able to do the most extraordinary things like uh, put a man on the moon or um, uh, have this conversation between Ottawa and uh, Northern England in, uh, you know, uh, real time. Um, all of these things are made possible by the process of innovation. Uh, it's the, the sole reason we've raised living standards to the, the degree we have. And it's come upon us over the last 200 years, particularly, in a sort of slightly unexpected way. We didn't really plan it this way. Nobody set out to say, let's have an industrial revolution followed by a um, computer revolution. Um, it, it sort of, uh, you know, it almost took humanity by surprise. And I'm not convinced we really know why it happened, when and where it did. So in that sense, it's both very important and slightly puzzling. That's what attracted me to, to try and tackle this topic. Um, you know, in in the book, I, I want to draw out this distinction early on in our discussion because I think it's something that a lot of people they conflate the idea of innovation and invention. And, and in your book, you talk about the difference between these two things. Can you maybe uh, expand a little bit on that? What is the difference between innovation and invention? Well, I slightly made up my own distinction here because I'm not sure it's it's in the dictionaries yet. But I think what most people mean by uh, invention is coming up with a new prototype of a device, you know, a brand new widget or or something like that. Whereas innovation to me is making that new widget affordable, available and reliable so that people can actually use it. You know, coming up with the first computer that's the size of a, um, uh, of a small house and uh, requires an enormous amount of energy and can only calculate the trajectory of artillery shells is one thing. But turning that into a simple laptop device whereby you can play games and surf the internet and so on is, a, is an enormously complicated process that involves a lot of different people who we wouldn't necessarily call innovate sorry inventors but we would call them innovators who brought down the price who increased the reliability who made things more accessible all that kind of stuff so if you take for example someone like jeff bezos uh, very much a pioneer of e-commerce who spotted early that that it was going to be possible to sell stuff online starting with books um, and he brought in a number of uh, innovations that enabled him to become uh, the world leader in e-commerce and amazon uh, to grow like a, um, a beanstalk uh, but you'd not call him an inventor at any point um, you know, he wouldn't claim to be, I don't think. He would claim to be an innovator, but not an inventor. And that's the distinction I'm getting at, because we build statues to the inventors. We give them Nobel Prizes and patents. We don't do anything like that for in innovators to the same degree. We, we kind of look down our noses at them, say, oh, they've made stuff cheap and, you know, da, da, da. So my my purpose in this book was partly to, to re resuscitate the importance of the innovator. Um, and it's very much not a person, it's a process, it's, it's a collective thing that people do together is 
you know, improve products until they are really useful to people. Yeah, that's an interesting point. And speaking about Bezos particularly, you're right. He didn't invent selling books. He didn't invent the internet. He didn't invent e-commerce. But he did He did come up with a way, an innovative way to sell things on the internet that no one else had done before. So he didn't invent anything. So is, is it also fair to say that the, the difference between invention is, uh, you know, inventions involve something uh, completely new perhaps, whereas innovations are maybe using existing things in new ways or com coming up with new ways uh, to leverage what we already have. That's certainly true. And, and if you look at um, most uh, novel technologies, they actually consist of existing technologies combined in novel ways. Um, you know, there are relatively few sort of completely de novo things that come into our existence. They make use of the existing technologies we have, but but come up with fresh combinations of them. Uh, you know, I often talk about this process as being like ideas having sex. And I mean that in a quite literal sense, because... Right the exchange of ideas is playing the same role in innovation that the exchange of genes and the recombination of genes plays through sexual reproduction in biological evolution. Um, that there is a, a surprisingly sort of similar um, process there, which is that it, it makes it cumulative. It makes it possible to bring things together. So just to give you an example, um, there's a uh, an object called a pill camera. I don't think it's actually all that useful in the end, but someone came up with it. You can swallow it. It takes a picture of your insides on the way through, uh, and that's uh, useful to uh, doctors. Um, it came about after a conversation over a garden fence between a gastroenterologist and a guided missile designer. Now, that's what I call ideas having yeah. sex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a perfect example of un and a spontaneous interaction, right? Not something that is easily planned. And I kind of want to get into that a bit. You, you mentioned this off the top, too, about how a lot of people pay lip service to innovation. Um, you know, there are, we have a lot of politicians that um, are are consumed with the idea of innovation and develop policy around it. What is it? What do you think most policymakers tend to get wrong about innovation and in, in shaping policy for it? Well, I think there's two things they get wrong. The first is that they don't take into account serendipity enough, the the process of, of go, uh, coming up with unexpected things, going in unexpected directions, the importance of changing direction. Uh, so if you look at, you know, the, the, the guy who invented the post-it note, you know, these little sticky bits of paper, I've got one here in front of me that you can stick on a computer, um, I mean, on a, you know, document or something. Um, he's called Art Fry. He worked for uh, 3M. Uh, he set off to invent a permanent glue for paper. He ended up inventing a temporary glue for paper. And then he suddenly realized that would be useful in his choir practice later that day. Um, so uh, that kind of serendipity, that kind of uh, nimble direction changing seems to me to be something that most government policy on innovation doesn't do uh, a particularly good job of, um, uh, of of doing. The other mistake that I think um, is made, and it comes back to this distinction between invention and in innovation, is that sci governments tend to think it's their job to support science so that it leads to technology. And I think that misreads the relation between those two things. Because actually, yes, you can develop technologies as a result of scientific discoveries. There's no question about that. But you can also develop scientific insights as a result of tinkering inventions in technology. It happens all the time. It has happened all the time. I mean, you know, we had vaccines long before we understood immunology. Uh, we had steam engines before we understood thermodynamics, et cetera, et cetera. And, the, you know, the story of gene editing more recently uh, it shows a, 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 an idea that bounced backwards and forwards between academic science and, in this case, the yogurt industry, and then back into academia. So um, I think governments tend still to see, and, and, and you know, anybody who studied this has, has said for years this is not the only way to see it, but governments still tend to see it in a linear way. You put science in one end of the pipe, you get technology out the other, and they don't make allowance for the fact that that pipe can be flowing both ways, um, or um, that the, the two might be developing in parallel. So that's another uh, phenomenon that I'd like to get governments to think more seriously about. 
You mentioned the role of serendipity. Uh, that I wonder if that sort of makes some politicians' heads explode if they're the types who they want to plan. I mean, the goal is to, as you say, have the output of more innovation. And so they are looking around for ways to, that they can sort of plan, or I guess they might go, they might use the word sort of incubate or encourage. Um, you know, is it possible to plan for innovation? Are there things that governments could do to perhaps increase the chances of the serendipity, if not uh, strictly planning for innovation? Sure. I mean, of course, there are things governments can do that will help innovation happen. Um, but, uh, you, you know, back to this point about planning, uh, governments are truly terrible at picking winners. Uh, they tend to listen to whoever's got their ear and say, look, I've got this brilliant thing that's going to change the world and you should listen to me and only me. And, and actually, they're often wrong. You know, so in the 1920s, the British government became obsessed with the idea that um, heavier than air airplanes would never be able to cross oceans. So what they had to do was pour money into airships because airships were the future, not just the British government, a lot of other governments, Americans and Germans particularly, too. Um, uh, you know, it was all about airships. Uh, and that turned out to be a dead end, that, that actually you could make airplanes cross oceans with uh, passengers and cargo on them quite easily after a while. Um, so, you know, the picking of losers is is a is a real problem for government. But what can governments do more positively? Well, in my view, obviously, you know, they need to, given that they take a large chunk of the income uh, of the population, they should put some of that back into supporting innovation in some form or other. But I I, I don't like the idea of sort of specifically hitting targets and plans and saying, let's solve the energy problem or let's solve um, some uh, cancer or something like that, because it tends, you know, it just tends not to work. You know, sometimes um, the, the you, you get sudden breakthroughs in areas where nobody's really expecting a breakthrough and other times you try to cause a breakthrough and nothing happens for decades. Um, so uh, in my view, what they need to do is, is, is cultivate the garden, you know, make make the world a place where entrepreneurs are free to come up with ideas, test them, get a quick decision out of government as to whether or not they're allowed to do certain things, because that often it turns out to be an enormous obstacle. You know, if you invent a new medical device, you enter a labyrinthine maze of approvals and regulations that take years and years and years, you know, for good reason that we want them to be safe, but it's dreadfully overdone and takes far too long. And we learned that lesson with the vaccines um, for COVID-19, particularly in the UK, funnily enough. We were very quick at approving new vaccines, so much so that the Europeans said we must have cheated and we must have not got a safe vaccine to start with. But actually, it was because the medical regulator had said, look, we're going to stop doing things in, par in sequence. We're going to do them in parallel. We're going to run all these tests together so that we can get a quicker decision. So quick decisions is one thing government can, can give. Um, uh, uh, as I say, the fertile encouragement of the freedom of people to come up with new ideas, back them, uh, change direction, fail, fail gracefully. You know, uh, again, if you talk to, again, Bezos or Thomas Edison, um, I have talked to Thomas Edison, he's dead, but um, uh, he, he wrote about, he said, I haven't failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that don't work. Uh, and Basil says something similar. He says, "You, if you're not swinging and missing, you're not going to get anywhere." Um, so, you know, get a, allow people to 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 play, to do trial and error on a massive scale, and that way, uh, you're going to get some good results. But don't expect to be able to dictate what those results are going to be. I have to drop a pearl of uh, Canadian wisdom here. Our famous hockey player, Wayne Gretzky, he has a famous saying that you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. And I think that might apply here. Um, do you think when it comes That's to brilliant. policymakers, yeah, when it comes to policymakers, is, is there reluctance to adopt sort of the, the logic that you're, you're advancing here? Is it just a function of the fact politicians are unwilling to acknowledge that in order to get some good outcomes, you have to accept some failure, you have to accept that um, it can't be planned and you have to stand back? It, it, um, because, I mean, your logic is pretty sound, but, and yet we see a lot of governments that seem determined to sort of, no, we're, we're going to plan this properly and we're not going to have any failures and we're only going to have successes. And you're saying that that's 
that is just not possible to guarantee? Well, I think the way we treat our politicians makes it very hard for them to do this kind of stuff because uh, we uh, take them to the cleaners if they uh, have a failure. You know, if they champion a technology and it goes wrong and it doesn't achieve anything and it costs a lot of uh, taxpayer money, um, we perhaps quite rightly, but perhaps not so rightly, uh, give them a hard time over it. Um, the media does, other politicians do, um, the public does, you know, so... Uh, there's actually nothing in it for them to say, well, you know, I, I thought it might work. I thought there was only a 10% chance, but it was worth a crack, wasn't it? You know, uh, so that's why doing these things in a political arena um, can, I think, be, be something of a risk. Um, uh, yeah, so it, it, it's, it's got to be, um, it's got to align with how the political system works. And imagine, it, you know, if you stood up as a, government, um, a lead, leader of a government and said, look, I'm going to um, make sure that we help people uh, invent biomedical advances, but I haven't the foggiest clue what they're going to be. You sound a bit daft, actually. <laughs> Whereas if you say, and I'm going to make sure that they address Alzheimer's, they address cancer, uh, they address food productivity and agriculture, these are our priorities. Um, they address climate change. You know, that's the kind of thing politicians like to be seen to be saying. You know, I am aligning, I'm forcing entrepreneurs and innovators to align with the priorities of this government. Well, it might be that that isn't where the, um, the, the pot of gold will be found under the rainbow. Right. And, and But the problem is the political incentives are all there for politicians to want to do those things and, and want to say those things. So I, I, I think you're right in that it, it puts them in a bit of a box. Um, I wanted to turn a bit to, uh, you know, differences in innovation. You, you, you talk about in your book that, uh, you know, even though innovation is, is a constant everywhere, it, it often moves at different speeds at different times in different industries. What, uh, you know, maybe you could uh, highlight a couple of notable periods uh, of innovation in different sectors and really sort of what accounts for the speeding up and the slowing down? Yeah, uh, this is really interesting to me. Um, my grandparents were born with the telephone and they died with the telephone. They didn't see much change in communication and computing in their lifetimes. You know, they were born around the turn of the last century and they died around 1970 something. Um, whereas they saw incredible changes in transport. They were born before the motor car, the aeroplane, and they died with men on the moon and supersonic jets and helicopters and everything. Uh, and they were able to travel cheaply and safely across oceans on airliners, which didn't even exist when they were born. So they had seen the most extraordinary changes in transport and very little change, frankly, in communication and computing. Mm -hmm. I've had exactly the opposite experience. Um, transport has changed very disappointingly in my lifetime. 747 was in service for 50 years. Still no transporters. The we still don't what? have trans we, do we still don't have transporters as in Star Trek. Exactly. <laughs> and all those things that 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 were the staple of science fiction in the 50s and 60s, personal jetpacks, um, gyrocopters, routine space travel, none of that happened. And that, that science fiction of the 50s and 60s says very little about telephones. <laughs> you know, you struggle to find anyone talking about the mobile phone or pictures on your um, phone or watching movies as you're sitting on a train. You know, things which have become uh, the most extraordinary changes in which have happened in my lifetime. So that suggests to me that there was something about transport in the first half of the 20th century that made it susceptible to a wave of innovation, a bushfire of innovation that then ran up against diminishing returns, natural obstacles, some kind of barriers. Whereas the same was true of computing and communication in the last 50 years or so. And of course, that then makes me think that maybe the computing and communication revolution will run out of steam. <laughs> Look at that word, steam. Um, and 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 I sort of think I see that happening. I don't feel the need to upgrade my iPhone any sorry my mobile phone anymore. You know, to anything. It, it's not that much better each time. And uh, likewise with laptops and computers. And as for the 
things I can do on the internet that I couldn't do 10 years ago, well, some of them are useful, but I'm not sure all of them are. Uh, so the driverless car may be coming, AI may be going to change our world, but I'm not convinced it's going to be the big story of the next 50 years. I think the big story may be biotechnology, it, you know, the ability to cure cancer, to change the way we age, um, those kind of things. And so I'm uh, probably wrong about that, by the way, because, uh, you know, as I say, it's very hard to, to see what's going to change when you look forward. Um, but uh, it, 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 it's worth pausing to remember that we tend to extrapolate the technologies that are changing fastest in our time and assume those are the ones that are going to be changing fastest in the future. And I don't think that's necessarily the case. Hmm. Um, you know, in spite of your, I mean, your book canvases throughout history, <clears throat> excuse me, I mean, a lot of important innovations, periods of innovation, some fascinating stories there. I think a lot of people would be surprised to know how some things came about that, I mean, serendipity plays a big role, as you say, but you also warn um, in the book that we actually have a lot less innovation than it might sometimes appear. So I, I wondered if you could sort of, is this a new phenomenon what accounts for this? Yeah, if you leave the digital innovation on one side, you know, new forms of social media and things like that. I'm not sure we're living in a golden age of, of innovation at all. Um, uh, as I say, transport's not changing very much. Um, yes, there are more cup holders. Yes, there are budget airliners. Yes, the planes are safer. But, you know, the, we, we're longing for those innovations that'll, that'll transform um, uh, travel again and make it even more spectacularly um, useful than it is. And when you think about energy innovation, we're, you know, we're stuck with a 1960s version of nuclear power, which we don't seem to be able to improve on much because um, we uh, basically uh, have made it so difficult to innovate with, you know, overdone uh, sort of safety braced regulation that, that makes it extremely expensive to innovate. And so nobody does. Um, uh, we're, we're, we're doing our best to squeeze some innovation into some me medieval technologies like the windmill, <laughs> and we're getting some results, but it's not really that spectacular. Um, we don't seem to be able to bring the price down uh, of that kind of thing. Uh, construction's interesting. You know, we've got new glass buildings and uh, better high-tech uh, designs and things like that, but it's it, it's not really brought down the price of of housing um, or buildings. In fact, they're rather going up because we can't seem to squeeze the cost of labor out of that kind of uh, sector. So I would argue that actually, in some ways, compared with, say, the first half of the 20th century or the second half of the 19th century, when electricity started to come in and, you know, the light bulb and, I mean, uh, you know, and the flush toilet, incredibly useful and um, spectacular things came online. Um, compared with that, we're not living through an innovation feast. We're living through a bit of an innovation famine. And I'm concerned about that because I think quite a lot of it's coming from um, uh, uh, regulations, government policy, the opposition from vested interests, entrenched uh, incumbent companies, making it difficult for insurgents and so on. So I, I, I think... Um, uh, I, you know, we, we pay lip service to enjoying innovation, but I suspect we're strangling that golden goose a little bit. Um, I wanted to touch on uh, on climate change a little bit because you mentioned windmills and nuclear. Um, you know, I think a lot of people have made the case. I think you make it in your book, too, that it, it, innovation is going to be a, a critical component, a key part in any sort of fight in reducing carbon emissions. <clears throat> and, and so it's your view that, you know, right now we're simply nowhere near getting there because we're not in a very fertile environment for, for innovation, especially in the technologies that will help us uh, reduce our emissions. Yes, on the whole, I think that is my concern. Um, uh, I think if we try to solve climate change with today's existing technology, we will end up replacing a, um, a, a pretty efficient energy system based on fossil fuels with a, a somewhat inefficient one based on renewable energy, which uses huge quantities of the landscape again. You know, it's back to the medieval idea that you need the landscape 
because because you know wind and sun and so on are very very dilute very very non-concentrated forms of energy so you need large areas of land to to, to make energy out of them and they're not making much inroads i mean we're about 85 percent dependent on fossil fuels for our energy still which is roughly where we were 20 years ago because nuclear has declined while renewable has increased so for me the big one is going to be new forms of nuclear fission um, based on uh, advanced gas cooled reactors uh, that produce um, uh, industrial heat as well as electricity and things like that, uh, and that are inherently safe in design. I mean, they're all there on the on the drawing board, but nobody seems to be able to get their act together to to actually approve and build these things. Um, uh, and then fusion. Uh, I, I do think that fusion is on the brink of some quite exciting results and the private sector is piling into it, which is a good sign um, and will probably speed things up as they did with genomics and other sectors. Um, so if we could get fusion going, effectively we're using water, small quantities of water, which gives us deuterium um, and lithium, which gives us tritium uh, as a fuel to produce almost limitless, yeah, effectively limitless um, quantities of available energy. And then we can get back to enjoying ourselves and having cheap energy and not polluting anything and, and not affecting the uh, carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere. If that came along, say in 2050, as a really affordable, really reliable technology, I think we'd look really foolish if we'd dash to net zero with some quite uh, inadequate technologies before then, um, uh, I think we need to, you know, we need to be researching the heck out of um, uh, all forms of nuclear uh, in order to um, come up with uh, some technologies that could solve this problem without uh, having to constrain um, our economic growth or anything like that, which is which is what a lot of people I think actually want. They want us to sort of scale back our consumption and so on. And I'm not sure that's really... Um, a viable political option. Yeah, fair enough. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the impact of our current sort of political zeitgeist on innovation. I think it's fair to say we're living in a political era where there's a fair bit of sort of reactionary political sentiment. There's a sort of backlash against change. Um, do you think that this might make people uh, I, I mean, I think um, objectively, a lot of past innovations have, as you said, they've improved our quality of life immensely. The world has changed dramatically in 200 years and, and, and mostly for the better. But do you think that this sort of political zeitgeist we're in now might make pe most people more or a lot of people more fearful of innovation and, and reluctant to embrace it and sort of see it as a threat as, a, as opposed to an opportunity? Yes, I am genuinely worried about that. Uh, I mean, we've always been uh, negative about new technologies to some degree. If you look at the introduction of coffee in the 1500s, it was banned almost everywhere again and again and again. They had to keep banning it because it kept creeping back in. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it was unpopular because uh, the wine and beer industry had a vested interest in keeping it out. And so they made up stuff about how it was uh, bad for you. Um, and it was unpopular because it led to coffee houses where people had conversations. And some of those conversations were about whether the king was doing a good job and, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. So, so th there's a, there's a parallel there. I mean, you can pick up the parallels, can't you? You know, when the umbrella was first introduced, the handsome cab operators of London tried to get it banned. You see that kind of thing happening all the time. Now you see existing companies lobbying behind the scenes and they've often got a huge amount of political access and power to do that, to say, oh, you shouldn't go down that route. That's dangerous. You know, you, you, it, it's much better to stick with our tr true and trusted technology. They erect barriers to entry to, to their rivals. And that's one of the reasons you're not seeing the rapid turnover in companies in the top 50. Uh, you're not seeing the age of entrepreneurs coming down anymore. It's going up again. You know, it's sort of feels like this is rather a reactionary, your word, but I think it's a good one, um, rather a reactionary age. Um, and uh, the, there's an awful lot of people with vested interests in saying, no, that's a bad idea. I mean, in Europe, we've banned genetically modified crops for 30 years now. That's madness. They are really, really good at reducing the dependence of agriculture on uh, chemicals and other pesticides. They're really good at increasing yields. Um, they're really good at improving biodiversity alongside farming, you know, and yet because of some completely specious campaigns that were really about 
how to raise money for environmental organizations, um, uh, we, we basically turned our back on them uh, in, in a, an entire continent. We're trying to undo that bit by bit with the help of um, newer versions of the technologies, uh, but it's, it's, it's hard going. So, yes, I do think the enemies of change have a surprising degree of the upper hand. And you have only to look at the vaccine stories of the last year or two. We've had a spectacular example of how a technology that was actually very slow to, de to, to develop for years and years and years, vaccine development hadn't speeded up since the 1950s really, did speed up in response to the pandemic. You did get a new technology coming online in the form of the messenger RNA vaccines. Um, partly perhaps because they overclaimed or because governments forced them on people a little too aggressively or something, but also because there's a sort of culture of um, negativity, uh, we've got a huge anti-vax movement, uh, which I think is problematic. It's worse in some countries than others. Um, uh, and that just is an emblem of how people just don't, uh, you know, oh, they're, they're easily scared into thinking that a new technology is a bad thing. They only hear yep. about the name, the precautionary principle, it's called, when you talk about the risks of a new technology, but you don't talk about the benefits of a new technology. <clears throat> yeah, and it's interesting on the vaccines, whether it, it, to try and separate how much of the hesitancy around vaccines has to do with it's not the performance of the vaccine itself so much as it is the politics around the vaccine, as you mentioned, you know, governments uh, forcing people to take it or sort of, um, um, you know, isolating people who don't take it from society. That uh, it'd be interesting to sort of try and separate how much of that is genuine skepticism, how much of it is informed by sort of other political actions around the vaccines. Um yeah. You, you, you talk a little bit about um, sort of uh, vested interests and incumbents are protecting their turf. And I think that's that's always been true. I wanted to <clears throat> sort of talk about intellectual property um, <clears throat> in that context, because you mentioned in your book that, um, that your view is it's actually too strong intellectual property is actually harmful for innovation. And uh, we know there's there's a there's a very common argument on the other side of that that argues that intellectual property rights are, are are very important you know you don't want to create disincentives to innovate because people can't be assured they they can benefit from their innovations um, but you don't buy that argument so I was wondering if you could sort of uh, sort of expand on that a bit about why you think uh, you know too much intellectual property actually hurts innovation yes well um, I, I, I think the evidence shows that uh, I mean it could go either way you know th in theory you could be right that that uh, the intellectual property incentivizes people. Um, or it could be that intellectual property simply acts as a barrier to entry and, and allows people to profit from innovations and not continue making them. Um, mm. And that, I think, is what the evidence shows, is that particularly with the strengthening of intellectual property that we've seen over the last few decades, a lot of it at the behest of vested interests like, you know, the Disney Corporation demanding copyright on um, uh, works for 70 years after the author's death so they can go on making money out of Mickey Mouse. Uh, you know, I'm an author. That means my grandchildren are going to be making money out of my books. Not very much money, but a little bit. Well, why should they? What, you know, what have they done to deserve it? They don't exist, by the way, so I'm not being rude about any individuals, but you get the point. Um, so uh, if you look at um, examples of where countries strengthen intellectual properties or weaken them, you don't find good evidence for intellectual property incentivizing uh, innovation. Uh, if you look at um, what happens with 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 patenting, um, when a patent expires, you get a burst of innovation. It happened recently with 3D printing. The, the, the main patents on 3D printing expired and suddenly there's a flourishing of innovation. I tell a story of a similar thing happening with corrugated iron in the 19th century. When the patent expired, instead of just one kind of corrugated iron, suddenly there's a lot of new kinds. So that suggests that the patent has actually stopped innovation happening. And because what the patent does is it gives far too much credit to one person who happens to be in the right place at the right time when a technology gets to the point where he can patent it. Um, whereas, uh, you know, actually he's built on the work of a lot of other people that came before him and a lot of other people are going to improve his work after that. So I want a shorter patent life, um, more flexible, and industries that don't rely on income from patents like the computer industry, the digital industry over the last um, 50 years, actually 
patents were of very little use to them, yet they innovated fine. And, you know, when we basically bust the copyright on um, uh, recorded songs so that everybody pirated and then streamed songs, and that meant that the Beatles had to go back on the road, or maybe not the Beatles, but you know what I mean. Um, uh, and and uh, so what? You know, why should they sit back and not write songs but get lots of money for old songs? So um, I personally, I'm a bit of an anarchist when it comes to intellectual property. I think the evidence that you need that I think the evidence that it's a a good that the word property is a good metaphor is very poor. I think it's not a good metaphor at all. Uh, and I think that because um, the whole point of in innovating something is to share it, and that's not the case with real property. You want to enjoy it exclusively in, re- in the case of real property, like a house, for example. Um, so I think that uh, uh, actually we've uh, we've we've worsened the problem um, of innovation by making intellectual property too strong. Now I admit that there are cases like inventing a new drug and then finding rip-off generics when you've had taken when you've spent a billion dollars on uh, on getting it approved doesn't seem fair. Um, But even in that case, you can make an argument that you're, you know, if you're the drug company, well, then get on and invent another one. You know, keep ahead of your competitors, because actually that's possible. You've got a huge amount of tacit knowledge that enables you to to stay ahead of the pack. I tell the story of lots of innovators from, you know, uh, Morse with the telegraph to Marconi with the radio and others who, having invented something, then spent years of their life in court defending their patents against someone who was um, um, inventing a rival version of the technology. What a waste of their time. You know, they shouldn't be in court defending their patents. They should be out there improving their own technology. Um, So, uh, yeah, put me down as an anarchist on intellectual property. Well, that's interesting because you're making the argument here. I think it's a a very compelling one that... the value in a in of, of if you're the first mover and you an, an innovator invent something new, there's inherent value in that, and that um, you know the, the argument that well my competitor can come along and steal it and 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 use it and it didn't cost them anything and that's unfair. Well, you still have the advantage in that you have the knowledge, you have the expertise that it took to develop this, and so that there is still value in that. Um, and I think I think it's reasonable to say you know I I don't know I'm quite the anarchist you are, but you know, ha- trying to better balance, trying to better balance the incentives by having sort of shorter periods or limitations on the patent so that you do have some assurance that you're not going to lose everything. But you're also, as you say, not allowed to just sort of sit back and coast because you because you figured something out once. Yes. And we should perhaps remember that that the the point of a patent um, is to uh, it's, it's inherent in the word is what the word means is to open up what you've done to share with the world what you've done. You know, it, it's it's the opposite of being secretive about it. Uh, instead of keeping your 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 secrets um, about what you've done, you you publish it, but in return you get a monopoly income. Um, so, yes, the publishing is good because it enables other people to learn from it. Um, but I think the, the terms of patents are too long, they're too easy to get, they're too inflexible, and uh, they, uh, you know, there are a whole companies called patent trolls which just buy up patents and then sue people um they don't have any intention of doing any innovating themselves they're just saying oh we could actually um uh, force people to give us some income to let let them use this patent you you could you could consider it an innovative form of speculating matt i guess uh that's that's what the patent (laughs) trolls might argue um i've got one more question and then we've got a bunch of questions from the audience so so my question to you is and it's about the point you make in your book uh where you sort of you make the case that bigger businesses are less innovative um and i wanted to put to you whether or not that that uh, sort of uh characterization might always hold because on the one hand yes uh you know a bigger business probably more bureaucratic, more risk averse, there's more downside risk for them. But on the other hand, they also have more resources. So I wanted to perhaps put to you a different framing. What if the newness of a company is actually a better indicator of their capacity to innovate than their size? Because I think that might explain why you have uh, newer technology companies that are 20 years old or less. Um, They're still very innovative, but other companies the same size that are maybe 100 years old, not very innovative. So in other words, is it maybe also a question of culture, 
Um, and sort of the longer you're there, the less innovative you get, rather than just the size uh, size of your business. Yeah, in support of that viewpoint, um, I once asked Jeff Bezos, um, now that you're big, Amazon, how do you plan to stay innovative? And uh, and it was quite, his inter- his answer was very interesting, and, and it, he gave me some of the the, the you know the management. Um, patterns that he's built in. Uh, you know, a lot of this is in the public domain. It's not um, uh, a secret or anything. Things like the the two pizza rule: that no meeting should ever be so large that you can't consume two pizzas. Um, but also, uh, there's a sort of reverse veto he operated, whereby uh, if a junior employee has a smart idea on the shop floor and goes to um, his uh, the, the management team immediately above it and says, look, you should try this idea. And they think it's a bad idea and shouldn't be pursued. But one of them thinks it's a good idea. A mon- minority of them think it's a good idea. Then top ma- senior management has to hear about it. In other words, you can't, you can't have a majority vetoing ideas within the company. You've got to hear about minority maverick ideas because otherwise you're going to have people with vested interests shutting down uh, new thoughts as they come up the company. And so I think Amazon is quite a good example of a, of a company that grew very big and was still very innovative, at least for a while. I wonder if it'll, if it'll go on forever doing that. But in opposition to what you say, I would cite Nokia. Nokia is a, it was a fairly old company, but doing, uh, making, you know, forestry equipment in Finland. And then it reinvented itself completely. And by it had, you know, walkie talkie technology. And so it decided to go into mobile phones. It became really good at it. It became the world's biggest um, mobile phone company by a mile. I mean, it was way bigger than Motorola and all its other um, rivals. Uh, it, you know, it dominated research in mobile phone technology. Uh, it, uh, it, 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 you know, it, it was the giant in in the field, but it was still, in a sense, a very new company. The whole technology was only about ten years old. It was, it was all, everybody was young and flashy and wore t-shirts. But they had a vested interest in voice, and they didn't see the data revolution coming. And Apple basically ate their lunch. And they uh, disappeared, or, or they didn't quite disappear, but they ended up being taken over for a tiny fraction of their value at the peak. So that was quite a, a new young company that got too big and got too um, uh, complacent and uh, sluggish, I would argue. So it's a bit of both, newness and size. I'd say, too, there's a somber Canadian uh, uh, parallel to Nokia in BlackBerry, which is from my hometown. Yeah. I mean, if you go back 15 years, they dominated the smartphone market and then sort of stood still. And now they're, they're basically ceased to exist. So at least not in that. Uh, yeah, that well, market. arguably, BlackBerry dominated data and, and Nokia dominated voice and uh, in those days. Um, and I think I had both, didn't I, in my pocket at one point. And then suddenly I had the iPhone and I only needed one. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, that was it's, it's 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 amazing to think how recently uh, that was too, and the, and the world has definitely uh, changed quickly. Um, we've got uh, we've got a bunch of uh, uh, audience questions here. Some are some are fairly broad. I, I wanted to put th- this one to you from Richard. Ask a question about uh, he he mentions the Israeli model of developing innovation. I think this is uh, so along the lines of sort of Maria Mazzucato's entrepreneurial state arguments. Um, you know, what, what do you say to her arguments? I know you address it a bit in the book about, you know, government should be making these big bets. Government has been behind a lot of uh, the development of, of key technologies because they put a lot of resources. They have the resources. They have the, um, you know, ability to tolerate these losses. Uh, so what do you say to that? Yeah, well, it, 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 what she essentially argues is that we need government to be doing mission-oriented innovation, that it should set a goal, like getting to the moon or, or, or whatever, uh, and because it's very good at doing that. And as you say, it's got the patience and the deep pockets to be able to, to get us there. But then the examples she gives just don't seem to support that, in my view, at all. She talks about the importance of government as an innovator in the rail industry but for the vast majority of its time certainly back in the 19th century the the, the railway industry was in the private sector not in the government um, uh, and 
Uh, she talks about, you know, the, the role of the government inventing the mobile phone technology because of the plasma screen, which came out of a, public, a publicly funded project. But actually, that was serendipity. The public funding was just for a research project, which happened to come up with plasma screen technology, which um, played a role, but not the only role, in the development of, of cell phones and, and things like that. So I don't think she produces very good examples for me of mission-oriented government um, uh, producing results, with the exception of the Apollo mission. And the Apollo mission is a bit of an exception that proves the rule, because um, thrilling though it was, and I, you know, am old enough to remember Neil Armstrong walking on the moon when I was 11 years old, um, uh, and what an incredible achievement, but it didn't produce anything in the way of useful products for humanity. That is a controversial statement, I know, and I'll have people telling me about um, nonstick frying pans, etc. And you know, the, NASA likes to come up with a long list of technologies that came out of of, of the uh, that program. But frankly, that the list doesn't stand up. They they great uh, the, the nonstick frying pan is a myth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So yes, they they helped push along some technologies, but. Um, uh, the private sector was pushing them along just as well. So I'm 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 not a fan of Mariana Mazzucato's argument, and I don't I, I personally don't think Israel is a good example of that either. Because I think although Israel is a very innovative nation, has uh, become a you know startup nation was the name of a book about in, uh, Israel, and uh, has done that well. It's not done it through mission oriented. It's done it for putting in place the conditions for venture capital and entrepreneurs to be nimble and fast and decisive in picking uh, ideas to, to champion. Okay. I got a question here from David um, who asks, what would you consider the, the difference to be between innovation and uh, research and development? Is there, is there a distinction to be made between those two things? Well, to some extent, my invention innovation dis distinction will map onto research and development or, um, you know, res no, uh, sorry, that's not quite right. What I meant, but my, my distinction between technological innovation on the one hand is like development and scientific research is like research. So um, the, the, the fact that we say R&D is a good thing because it means that we are thinking about both research and development. Um, it's important not to think in terms of just research producing uh, innovation. I think development needs to be part of it. The, the boring stuff of making something cheap, affordable and reliable, as I said. Um, but I think that on the whole, if you look at what happens, um, sometimes development gets neglected uh, and uh, there's a little too much esoteric research thinking going on, even inside companies. And Interestingly, um, R&D departments tend to become uh, somewhat um, uh, sort of non-innovative after a while, I think. Procter & Gamble took an interesting decision some years ago. They said, look, we've got tons of scientists thinking up new forms of toothpaste and things like that. Um, they're not actually producing the goods to the degree we'd want. Why don't we give up all that up and do our R&D by going out to universities, listening to what they're doing, finding departments who are working on interesting stuff and, 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 and also small companies and harvesting um, ideas from outside the company. And that way we don't get hung up on our own stuff that we invented. We've got no vested interest in it. We've got no sort of emotional attachment to it. Um, we can abandon it if it's not working. We can champion other things that come in. Uh, so they called it the open innovation model, and it has been very successful for them. Okay. That's a very interesting. Um, the question here from Jeff, um, are we training students to be innovative? Uh, I guess that's maybe a question about the, the education system or just maybe cultural values generally, but are, are we training students to be innovative? Well, uh, probably not. And my complaint here is that partly we tend to talk about invention and innovation in a way that probably discourages people from thinking that they can take part in it. Mm. So what we do is we say, here's this story about this amazing person who invented the steam engine. He was a genius. We've got a statue to him. And what that tells kids is, oh, I'm not a genius, so I can't innovate. I can't invent. Um, or we say, um, uh, 
isn't it wonderful how some people are creative, like Steve Jobs? Most people are not like that. He's amazing. He's exceptional. He's unique. And so we go away with the feeling, okay, so inventors and innovators have this special blood flowing in their veins called creativity that the rest mm. of us don't have. And I think it's important not to give kids that message. I like telling stories about really ordinary people who just did more trial and error or were more pers uh, persistent or, or, or simply, um, uh, you know, thought outside the box in a sort of interesting way. Uh, not because they were cleverer. I mean, look at the story of the aeroplane. Um, Orville and Wilbur Wright did not have a degree between them. Their sister had a degree, interestingly. They didn't. Um, they were bicycle mechanics from Dayton, Ohio. You know, what the heck has that got to do with anything? But they, they solved a problem that much greater minds were working on and working on less effectively. And, and you may say, well, that's a long time ago. But actually, there are examples more recently uh, of people who, um, uh, uh, you know, are, are you know, frankly, they're not extraordinary people. They're ordinary people. But because they didn't give up at the first hurdle, because they were determined and obsessed, they got some incredible results. So I like I want us to tell students that you don't have to be the smartest in the class. Um, you don't have something special about you. You don't have to be a sort of Steve Jobs wonder person who, you know, uh, has 16 ideas before breakfast. You just have to keep trying and you might do really well. It's a related question here from Harold when he asks, how should we be recognizing innovation? And I wonder if... Um, as you've sort of said, if we if we make it sound like only geniuses, only the types of people that we put statues up uh, for are, can be innovative, that that's a problem. So what could we maybe do instead? Is it like you said, a matter of telling stories and sort of reiterating that it, it, it is something that actually almost everyone can do if you put your mind to it? Yeah, no. And, and, and also, it's a very collective thing. It's not just one. It's never one person. It's always a, a, a network of people that solves a problem. Um, one thing we can do is um, do more open innovation. And what, what I mean by that is there's a site, a website called Innocentive, where um, companies can post problems um, and say, look, we've run into this insuperable problem in our um, innovation system. We can't seem to crack it. Has anyone got any ideas? And we'll reward you if you if you come up with an idea. And it works quite well. And some interesting problems have been solved uh, on that site. But one study of it showed that, that the ideas were always coming from left field. They were always coming from outside the industry that the company was in, um, that it was uh, it was particularly helpful for people who weren't part of the um, group think uh, to, to get involved. So I wonder if there's something we can do to sort of uh, engage citizens in uh, this open innovation process. I mean, there's a, there's a lovely story I tell in my book about um, a the parents of diabetics who, but diabetic kids, who knew the importance of monitoring their kids' sugar levels, um, glucose levels, you know, at all times, but needed to solve the problem of how to do so when the kids are at school and they're at work, um, and basically came up with an online uh, monitor um, device and kind of sold it back to the industry to, to make it. Um, and I just think if we tell stories like that, uh, uh, and we give prizes for things like that, um, then uh, we can do a lot with prizes, actually. You know, incentives matter. I, yeah. I was critical of patents. You know, patents give you a, a monopoly after you've invented something. Prizes just give you a reward and they don't give you anything exclusive. You know, so if you say Bill Gates did this, actually, the Gates Foundation, um, they said um, if any pharmaceutical firm can come up with a um, pneumococcus. No, it wasn't pneumococcus. It wasn't pertussis. What, uh, ah, I can't remember. Anyway, a, a, a particular bacterium that was causing real problems for poor kids in the um, uh, uh, developing world, 
and therefore wasn't really worth pharmaceutical industry developing a vaccine for it. But the Gates Foundation said, if one of you can come up with a good vaccine for this, we'll give you a whacking great reward. You know, call it a prize, whatever you like. It consisted of a uh, of a sort of uh, upgraded price for selling it. You know, the Gates Foundation would pay extra on top of what what you were charging, so you could sell it cheap, but but get well rewarded for it. And actually, it worked really well. Three companies came up with vaccines pretty quickly. So prizes um, for innovators, we don't do enough of that. We spend uh, we, we 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 need to do more of that. That sounds like a great idea. Incentives matter, of course. Um, well, uh, we're, uh, I'm going to give you one more question, Matt, a, a pretty easy one. And I asked this to you as someone who's, who's uh, canvassed sort of the history of innovations. I wanted to ask you if you could name two innovations, one in the last 100 years and maybe one of the last 20 years. What are the two things you think have had the biggest impact on, on people's lives? Well, I think in 100 years, I've got to say the computer. Um I mean, it is quite extraordinary how much it's changed our world. We wouldn't be talking um, right now pers- without it. So, <laughs> exactly, and and you know the way it just it's involved in everything we do these days is is extraordinary and, and remarkable. And as for twenty years, I'm going to name CRISPR, the gene editing technology, which was invented in the last fifteen years, really. Um, although the prehistory goes back a little further than that, because I don't think it's yet changed the world very dramatically. Um, It's produced some interesting medical and agricultural um, innovations, but I think it's going to change the world dramatically. Uh, I think it's going to give us uh, a a way to tackle cancer, a way to tackle Alzheimer's, um, uh, a way to tackle aging probably in itself. And, you know, just here's a a sort of wacky thing that's going to come out of CRISPR, I'm pretty sure, quite soon, and I've actually been involved in discussions on this, um, it's going to enable us to bring back certain extinct species from extinction uh, because it enables us to go in and edit genomes. Um, so we edit the, the genome of a, of a related creature back to the uh, genome that we've been able to read of. Um, so so the last 20 years, it's genomics and, and gene editing. The last 100 years, it's computers. Um, those, for me, are the, the, the big stories. But then, you know, I could have named all sorts of other things that have been important and and perhaps i'm um uh you know uh being a bit uh, partisan with some of those examples well on the genomic side i hope we don't have a redo of jurassic park and that that uh, we have a little bit uh, well, more benign uh, success with that yeah i mean on the whole um dinosaurs have been dead too long we can't read their <laughs> genomes so sadly it, it's not going to work but i'd quite like to see one wouldn't you yeah I just don't yeah. want you know, that Richard Attenborough character being in charge because he was very irresponsible. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, Hollywood, Hollywood's disappointed we can't bring back the dinosaurs, but bringing back uh, other animals might be uh, might be the order of the day. Well, Matt, thank you so much uh, for, for joining us. That's all the time we've got today. I want to thank you again for, for, for talking to us about innovation today. It was a fascinating discussion. Um, I also want to thank you, the audience, uh, for tuning in, and we will catch you all on the next uh, McDonald Lorient Institute webinar.